Hello, Professor. Hello. Can you hear us properly? I can hear you fine, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Hi. Hi there. Hello. I'm Arik. I am. Yeah. We would like to welcome you here. It's a real pleasure uh, to be with you. Rather an honor for all of us to be with you. Yes. Well, it's pretty easy this way, right? I don't have to travel all the way to uh, Pakistan. So. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what I was talking to my colleagues uh, yesterday that probably would we would have never been able to have you here. Uh, and our audience uh, would have uh, never been able to listen to uh, such an accomplished person. In, in... Right. I mean, I've been to India a few times, but I've never been to Pakistan. So. Yeah. So for us, COVID is a blessing in disguise. Right, and I think this will continue in the future. I think you know, once people oh yeah yeah definitely get used to the idea then yeah because uh, I think everybody is used to this kind of medium now yeah uh, so for us it's you know we are getting more and more people accepting our uh, invitation and once they see the list of speakers uh, big names like you and others they they say yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and more people want to do it, yes. <laughs> yeah. I would like to introduce uh, one of my colleagues, Amir Faisal. Uh, Faisal is presently chair of our uh, department, and he's actually uh, working on cell signaling. He, he has uh, expertise in uh, cancer therapeutics as well, drug discovery. Faisal, over to you. Uh, welcome, uh, uh, Professor Hunter. It's Thank really you. an honor to have you. Uh, here, I believe I, I I met you in one of the meetings of signal transduction in CAPTAT in Croatia. Oh, you were in one of the SAPTAT meetings, yeah. Yeah, in two thousand and two, probably. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so it's a real honor to have you here. Uh, really, I I worked uh, during my PhD in phosphorylation of an adapter protein, Shik. Uh, that I oh, think Shik, Tony yeah. Tony Pawson worked on a lot on that protein as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I identified some phosphorylation sites, and you know they were responsible for binding to a phosphatase. And then I went to London for with Professor Peter Parker's lab, where I worked on another adapter protein called MyD88. And mm -hmm. then you know here we have a small setup uh, with the early phase uh, drug discovery, where we work with a couple of targets, including. Uh, you know, to uh, FLIT3 inhibitors that can right. overcome the 835 y uh, resistance, as well as, you know, um, uh, inhibitors of microtubule uh, polymerization that can overcome uh, PGP-mediated multidrug resistance. So, you know, it's a real honor uh, that we're going to listen directly to you to talk about your work on, uh, recent work on drug discovery. Well, I wouldn't say it's really drug discovery, but it's targets that could be. Yeah, made targets, drug, yeah, yeah. Drug targets, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah the SAPTAP meeting is still going. Uh, there was supposed to be one last uh, September, but it was postponed. So I, sus okay. I assume they'll do it again sometime in probably 2022, maybe. I don't know. Okay, I think even Dichich used to organize it, and uh, with Yossi Slezinger, I, I, as I, as as I remember. I, yeah, well, I Yossi know. Yossi was born in Croatia. No, yeah, yeah. And that's yeah. why he's he helped Ivan. Ivan is still organizing it. Okay, okay, great. I work on epigenetics, uh, so I uh, I developed the first fruit fly lab in Pakistan. And oh, perhaps the only one still in Pakistan. Is and, that right? Uh, yeah. So, I'm surprised because it's such a cheap model organism. You would have thought people would adopt it. Yeah. Unfortunately, we didn't have uh, basic research here. I mean, people are driven by agenda of applied research and uh, not yeah. being able to apply even basic knowledge properly because they lack the fundamentals. So. Our school, where we are now housed, it's a private university in Lahore. And mm -hmm. uh, they took this bold initiative to establish School of Science and Engineering way back in 2008. Uh, okay. 
and I came back from ETH Zurich. I was working with Renato Paro that time in ETH, mm -hmm. uh, working on molecular chaperons uh, and their role in epigenetic cell memory, polycomb trithorax uh, paradigm. And when I came back, uh, I had to think about uh, whether you know to be driven by the local agenda in Pakistan or you know establish the uh, basic research. And I opted to establish basic research here. So I was the founding chair of the department. Uh, I was uh, rather the first one to join this department in 2008-9. And uh, since then, we have now uh, eight faculty members. Uh, Faisal is one, myself. Uh, we also have computational biology. So the idea was um, coming back from ETH, I, I learned that time that the future of biology is more quantitative. Yeah, and it's an interface. So I integrated bioinformatics and computational biology as part of cell and molecular biology here at LAMS. And since then, it's it's a, we have faculty uh, who came from NIH, from uh, University of Texas, Houston. So infectious diseases is a focal area. Then uh, structural biology of viral proteins, uh, HIV, HCV is an area. Two groups are working on, one is working on computational uh, cancer systems biology, and the other one is working on uh, computational genomics. So cancer systems biology is, is really something which is working at the uh, protein networks. Uh, Dr. Safiullah, I think he will also soon join. Uh, then we have uh, recently two more faculty are joining. One is working on, uh, epigenetics and cancer, the post-translational modifications of histones and if, if there is misregulation. He's coming from, Den, uh, from Denmark. And uh, agriculture or plant molecular biology is also a focal area. We recently have uh, uh, Khurram joining us from Raikan, Japan. So it's a, it's a small department focusing on basic research. And so that's why you, you see uh, only one fly lab uh, in Pakistan. I guess yeah, you can only afford, you want to have diversify. You can only have one fly lab. So where where do you get research support from? Yeah, so for the last ten years, uh, we the majority of funding came from the university because they knew on day one that you know uh, there's little funding from the government. And uh, being in Pakistan, we did apply to NIH to Welcome Trust. It's hard. It's very difficult. You know, they are competitive and people. Very, yeah. But we did apply continuously. We apply NIH uh, for GARTI grants and recently in collaboration with RO1 as well. But we have been, haven't been successful. Recently, one of, our, uh, recently one of our colleagues, she got Bill and Melinda Gates uh, funding for infectious diseases right. about right. tuberculosis, pseudomonas, etc. Uh, also, Higher Education Commission of Pakistan, uh, they also uh, fund, and that was bread and butter for us. I think their funding also played a pivotal role in uh, kicking off our small research programs. Um, we uh, Initially, we had only BS program. University wanted to see how good we do, you know, the vision I was selling or the mission I was selling as, as cell and molecular biology program. So when they saw that in 2012, the first batch when they graduated in, uh, with BS Biology from our school, when they saw that 12 or 13, all of them got placed in top tier universities in, in US for fully funded PhD, uh, they got even more confident that the program is, yeah. they, we, we are delivering something. And then they started, they approved our uh, grad program. So MS started in 2013 and PhD, a PhD started in 2013 and MS started in 2014, I believe. And we have a small PhD program, very rigorous. Uh, it's modeled after North American model, like they have to go through two years of uh, coursework and you know, uh, comprehensive mm -hmm. qualifier uh, and then research. Um, funding is a problem here, I would say. But somehow we are managing. I don't know how. <laughs> but whenever we need something, it, it's there. Uh, right. Yeah. Well, that's great to hear. Well done. It's great yeah. to have kicked it off and see how successful it is. 
yeah, we in, in the beginning we we were like we, what we did we we started uh, training our BS students because our bachelor students they have one year senior project mm -hmm. and uh, it was surprising we I we were you know throwing PhD level projects to them and students were so responsive they were doing wonderfully well. Uh, and then in 2014, when we had actual PhD program came in, so we had something there already running. We never gave up research, uh, although we had only bachelor's program to begin with. But I think the real test will be how sustainable it is in the next 15, 20 years. Uh, right. Yeah. That'll so, be a key. Yeah. If you, uh, can, you know, if you can train these people, send them to the US and they come back again, to set up their own groups, if it's possible, then that will be a, a way of sustaining it. I think. Yeah. So that that's uh, that's a very good point you highlighted. So in in last so since 2012, when the first batch graduated, so in last seven years, when we had these students graduating with BS Biology and now with MS as well, we have 80 students who have won fully funded PhDs in US. And they are Duke, Chicago, uh, North Carolina, Dartmouth, all over in, in US, uh, Texas A&M, at, at very respectable places. And idea was exactly when, when we developed the vision that to make it sustainable, we have to have continuous uh, young faculty because we will be soon uh, ending up our innings and we need uh, more youngsters. And I have, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, confident that out of those 80 so far, because few of them have moved into postdocs now right. after their PhD. And even if we get five, six back to Pakistan, out of those 80, that will turn the wheel because you know we don't have too many positions anyway here. Right, uh, yeah, no. yeah, so. Well, I, I think our first, yeah. our first batch of PhD students, they graduated last year. Yeah. And right. uh, I think out of five, uh, three applied for postdocs in US and they're all uh, now going uh, for a postdoc. You know, one of them is going at Moffitt, uh, another one is going at Northwestern. So, you know, we're very hopeful that once they get their training, they'll come back and set up their groups here. Yeah, I think the key will be, obviously, they're going to be spoiled in the US in terms of resources. <laughs> what can you do to lure them back again, I guess? So. Yeah, absolutely right. Okay, I think uh, let's start people. Are, uh, Abdullah, are people coming still? Let's start. It's time. Let me uh, first introduce uh, Professor Hunter. So it's a real player. Uh, we have uh, Professor Dr. Tony Hunter with us. He received his uh, BA and PhD from University of Cambridge uh, in England. And he completed his postdoc from Salk Institute uh, for Biological Studies, as well as at the University of Cambridge. Uh, ever since he's at Salk, I believe, uh, in 1979, uh, while studying tumor viruses, as a faculty member at the SOC, he discovered uh, a new class of protein kinases that phosphorylates tyrosine residues in proteins. Uh, and he demonstrated that uh, dysregulated tyrosine phosphorylation by an activated tyrosine kinase that causes malignant transformation. Uh, Subsequently, uh, he and others have also shown that tyrosine phosphorylation is a widespread uh, reversible protein modification uh, essential for the regulation of wide variety of cellular processes in multicellular eukaryotes, uh, including transmembrane signal transduction by surface receptors, cell growth control, uh, cell migration, axonal guidance, and uh, neuronal transmission and cell cycle control. Um, his work uh, has also shown uh, that aberrant uh, tyrosine phosphorylation is uh, caused in several types of human cancers and other diseases. 
uh, and this has led to successful development of inhibitors that target disease-causing uh, tyrosine kinases, such as Glivec. Uh, Glivec was developed when I think we were doing PhD at FMI in Basel. Uh, uh, a BCI-able inhibitor, uh, Glivec is, uh, that is used for treatment of uh, chronic, uh, chronic uh, myelogenous leukemia. And currently, 52 uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors are approved for clinical use in the treatment of cancer and other diseases. Um, Professor Hunter has spent much of the past 40 years studying protein kinases and phosphatases and the role of protein phosphorylation uh, in cell proliferation and cell cycle and how aberrant phosphorylation causes cancer. Uh, what I'm going to say next is even more overwhelming to me as well. His group also works on other types of post-translational modifications, including ubiquitination, uh, where he discovered the ring domain class of E3 ubiquitin ligases and somylation, uh, where he has identified a class of E3 ubiquitin ligases, stubbles that uh, specifically target somylated proteins for uh, ubiquitination. And most recently, uh, he has been studying histidine phosphorylation. Um, and I think for the audience today, this is something uh, going to be really new. And this histidine, uh, and he has generated monoclonal antibodies specific for the two isoforms of phosphohistidine. Um, and he has used uh, these to uncover a role of histidine phosphorylation in liver cancer. Uh, most recently, he has also investigated the role of stromal cells in pancreatic cancer uh, and discovered the role of LIF cytokine uh, secreted by cancer-associated fibroblast in tumor progression. Professor Hunter is duly recognized uh, all over the world. He has received many awards uh, for his work on tyrosine phosphorylation, including uh, a Gardner Canada International Award, the Louis Gross Horitz Prize, the Wolf Prize in Medicine, the Royal Medal of Royal Society, and most recently, the Peskler uh, AACI Award for Cancer Research, uh, the Soberg Prize for Cancer Research, and the Tank Prize for Biopharmaceutical Science. He is also Fellow of Royal Society of London, and the American Association for Cancer Research Academy. He's a member of NAS, uh, National Academy of Sciences, uh, USA, uh, EMBO, European Molecular Biology Organization, uh, AAAS, which is American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, and the US National Academy of Medicine and the American Philosophical Society. Uh, Professor Hunter, it's a real player. It's an honor for all of us. Uh, to be with you. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. You've almost given my talk for me, but let's see what I can do. <laughs> okay, so um, so is that okay? Yes, perfect. Okay, fine. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be able to give a talk uh, in Pakistan, a country I've never visited, but would like to. So today I thought I would start with some background information on post-translational modifications of proteins and how they can be used to regulate function Get up to get everyone up to speed and then talk about a little bit of history uh, concerning the discovery of tyrosine phosphorylation, particularly for the, the students in the audience, and then tell you briefly about her work on histidine phosphorylation and pancreatic cancer. So proteins, once they're synthesized, can be modified by covalent addition of, of different chemical groups. 
And in many cases, the linkage can be reversed. And so these are called reversible post-translation modifications or, or PTMs. And commonly, um, these modifications are found in unstructured regions of proteins, uh, such as this linker region here between these two domains, but it can, they can also be found within domains as well. And two of the most common types of uh, reversible PTM are phosphorylation, which I'll talk more about, and ubiquitylation, the addition of this small uh, protein molecule. So um, over 400 different uh, post-translational modifications are currently known. And to date, phosphorylation is still the most common and the cell signaling uh, phosphocyte plus database currently has nearly 300,000 different serine, threonine and tyrosine phosph phosphocytes uh, in their database. But other types of modification are also uh, quite common like ubiquitylation, acetylation and, and methylation. So, um, this is thought of as a mechanism for uh, increasing the complexity uh, of the proteome. A typical mammalian genome has around 20,000 genes, can make with alternative splicing maybe uh, 30, 40,000 different protein products. But if you now add in all the different types of post translational modification, the total number of um, protein entities increases significantly. And one of the major functions of reversible PTMs is to act as um, docking sites for other proteins which have specific binding domains like the SH2 domain discovered by Tony Pawson that uh, recognizes phosphotyrosine residues in a specific sequence context, FHA domains which recognize phosphothreonine, Domains that recognize ubiquitin and, and its relative sumo, and then particularly important in nuclear uh, transcriptional regulation, domains that recognize methylated and acetylated lysine. So phosphorylation is the archetypal PTM. It was first recognized back in the 1800s and uh, then worked on more extensively at the, at the beginning of the 20th century. And in, in 1954, it was, it was shown that um, ATP is used as the phosphate donor for protein phosphorylation. And the first protein kinase activities were identified. So for every one of these um, PTMs, there is a writer enzyme, in this case, a protein kinase that uses ATP to add phosphate to a site in a protein. <clears throat> There's an eraser enzyme, in this case, a protein phosphatase that removes the phosphate. And then generally there is a reader protein like an SH2 domain protein that recognizes the phosphorylated form of the protein. So you can say then that the protein is activated by phosphorylation could be inactivated as well, but and it enters a new state that's recognized to transduce a signal. <clears throat> and uh, that state can be reversed by the, the eraser uh, enzyme. So now for a little bit of history. So this order radiogram, this is a, an X-ray film used to detect radioactivity um, in the sample was what really started me, started my interest in, in protein phosphorylation. And I'm sure you probably can't see anything on this uh, autoradiogram, but there's a faint smudge right here. And that smudge is what became uh, phosphotyrosine in 1979. So at the time, <clears throat> I was working on uh, a DNA tumor virus, polyomavirus, a small DNA, circular DNA tumor virus with six genes. Three of those genes are expressed um, early during infection and lead to cell transformation. And particularly important is this middle-sized tumor antigen or middle T as I'll call it, 
which by itself can transform fibroblasts into tumor cells. And this is what I looked like back in uh, 1979. I, I had just grown a, a long beard um, and I still have it 40 years later. So we were puzzling about what middle T might do to transform cells. And a year earlier, Mark Collette and Ray Erickson reported that the, the SARC transforming protein of the RAS sarcoma virus, the RNA tumor virus, had an associated protein kinase activity. And so we were excited by this idea and thought it might be a common mechanism of, trans, of viral transformation and tested whether polyoma middle T has an associated kinase activity. And to do this, we isolated polyoma middle T by immunoprecipitating and incubated the immunoprecipitate with uh, gamma P32 ATP. And what we found was that uh, although the precipitate contained all three of the T antigens, large, middle, middle and small, um, only the middle T antigen became labeled with P32. <clears throat> and we found that uh, there were mutants of polyoma virus which lacked transforming activity, that's this set here, and their middle T proteins, which you can't see, uh, lacked this kinase activity. So there was a correlation between transformation and kinase activity. And um, three groups, ours, uh, with Walter Eckhart in particular, Alan Smith and Tom Benjamin, who are all working on polyomavirus had reached the same conclusion that middle T has an associated protein kinase activity. And we all presented our findings at the 1979 Cold Spring Harbor Symposium on tumor viruses held in May of 1979 and agreed to submit our papers to Cell when we got back. And ours was submitted uh, on June the 11th. And I thought I I'll show you the reviews on this paper because they are sort of amusing in hindsight. So none of the reviewers liked the paper. Um, reviewer one said, these two findings force one to seriously consider the possibility that the activity in the immunoprecipitates is an in vitro artifact. Reviewer two said, the product of this in vitro protein kinase-like reaction has not been characterized and it could be due to some other reaction like an adenylation. And reviewer three was most damning. He or she said, unfortunately, very few of these conclusions drawn by the authors are actually clearly substantiated by the data. So you would have thought the paper would be rejected outright. But at the time, Benjamin Lewin, who was the founding editor of Cell, made the decisions. And he decided that all three of our papers were um, interesting. And he asked us to revise them. And uh, I concentrated on, on this comment from reviewer two saying that we hadn't characterized the product of the kinase-like reaction. In fact, I had already suspected that that would be a criticism. And so the day after we submitted um, the paper, uh, I started set out to identify what amino acid was getting phosphorylated. And so we took some P32 labeled middle T from a kinase reaction and released the phosphoamino acids, in this case P32 labeled, by acid hydrolysis, and then separated the phosphoamino acids by thin layer electrophoresis at pH 1.9. <clears throat> and this was the first exposure of that thin layer plate, um, there was this very faint smudge. We'd also mixed in unlabeled phosphoserine and phosphotreonine, which, and we knew it would be one of those two because those were the only phosphoamino acids known. <clears throat> and uh, what we found, uh, as you can see in this darker four day exposure, is that this radioactive spot wasn't either phosphoserine or phosphotreonine. And through subsequent work that I won't, I won't uh, take you through, we could establish that this new spot was, was phosphotyrosine, um, which represents the third hydroxy amino acid. And so we put these data into a revised version of the paper and submitted it uh, back to 
sale in, in September. And interestingly, it was accepted two days later by Benjamin Lewin, which means that the paper was not re-reviewed. He just decided he wanted to accept it. And all three of our papers appeared back to back to back in the December issue of Cell in 1979. But we were the only group who had figured out what amino acid was getting phosphorylated. So in retrospect, <clears throat> it turned out that I had stumbled across phosphotyrosine because I'd been too lazy to make a fresh pH 1.9 buffer for that first experiment. And it turns out that upon repeated use of this buffer, which we used to do, uh, the pH drops to about pH 1.7. And only at pH 1.7 does phosphotyrosine separate from phosphotreonine. Now, at the time, we didn't know the nature of this kinase, but a few years later, Sarah Courtney showed that there is a cellular kinase associated with polyoma middle T, the CSARC protein kinase, so the activity is not intrinsic to middle T, but it is very important for its ability to transform cells. So there was actually one more stroke of luck, uh, luck in, in this set of experiments, because one day I took some P32 labeled middle T protein and decided to see if I could release phosphotyrosine by complete proteolytic digestion. You can see here middle T protease, just in case um, the phosphotyrosine was an artifact of acid hydrolysis. So in this experiment as a control, I decided to run the uh, SARC kinase product, which is the phosphorylated antibody, which had been reported to be uh, phosphorylated on threonine. And much to my amazement in this experiment done in September of 1979, you can see it turned out that SARC was a tyrosine kinase as well. And this was important because it enabled us to show that when you transform chick cells, with Rasa virus, there's a very large increase in the level of phosphotyrosine in protein. So you can see most of the phosphate is linked to serine and threonine, as we already knew. And in a normal cell, very little is linked to tyrosine, <clears throat> about 0.1%. But um, in, a, in a SARC transformed chick cell, you can see this level of phosphotyrosine rises dramatically. And so by this time, we were pretty convinced then that, that SARC was transforming cells by tyrosine phosphorylation. So we reported um, this in a, in a paper in, in PNAS in early 1980. And you might be interested to know then that all of the experiments reported in the cell and PNAS papers were done in less than five months. And all of the papers in this, all of the experiments in this um, PNES paper were done in less than a month, which is pretty remarkable. So even back 40 years ago, you could do good experiments, simple experiments, and get a paper published fairly easily. So at the end of all this, what we had shown was that in addition to serine and threonine being phosphorylated through their beta hydroxyl groups, the uh, hydroxyl ring of, of tyrosine could be phosphorylated. So once we knew this, I became very interested in, in the uh, enzymes that phosphorylate proteins, because at that time, the very first sequences uh, of a number of protein kinases, many of them actually the virally encoded uh, tyrosine kinases were emerging. These were deduced from the DNA sequence, whereas these three, like cycling AMP dependent protein kinase, were real protein sequences. So these were proteins that were sequenced by the old Sanger method. And I began to align these sequences by I. So BB stands for before BLAST here. So this was 1984. And it became clear that there were a number of motifs. You can see here in the, in the yellow and particularly the yellow lines that were conserved in all of these protein kinases, whether they were serine, threonine specific or tyrosine specific. And so that suggested that these sequences were gonna be important in, in function. 
And if you look closely, you can see that there's a difference between the tyrosine kinases in this motif and the serine threonine kinases. And this RDL motif distinguishes the serine threonine and tyrosine kinases. And this first alignment was actually published in an odd journal. It was published in the Scientific American in 1984 in an article I wrote on the proteins of oncogenes. So it became clear by aligning many protein kinase sequences as they came available, work I did with, with Steve Hanks, um, that the catalytic domain of the eukaryotic protein kinases is around 300 residues in length. It can be either a complete protein or part of a much larger protein like the EGF receptor. <clears throat> and that there are 12 subdomains which have conserved motifs. And it's through the use of these domains, actually, that a lot of additional kinase cloning was done by using degenerate um, oligonucleotides to prime PCR reactions. And the seminal work from Susan Taylor, my colleague across the street at UCSD, showed that many of the motifs that we had found in the sequence alignment line the catalytic cleft of this uh, bilobate catalytic domain from PKA, and um, which shows the bound ATP molecule with the gamma phosphate ready to be transferred. And mutation of most of these residues, particularly the lysine here, or this aspartate here, or this aspartate here, all kill kinase activity. So they are essential for activity. And using, as I said, largely uh, PCR cloning, the number of protein kinases began to rise rapidly in the uh, uh, middle uh, 1980s. And I started keeping count. And in 1987, I wrote a mini review in Cell suggesting that a, a human, a kinome of a mammal, a collection of protein kinase genes might be as large as 1,001. Now, it turns out the human kinome has around 530 protein kinase genes, a large number, but not 1,001. But the eucalyptus tree, the paramecium uh, uh, monoflagellate, and the rice uh, genome have kinomes well over two to 3,000 protein kinases. So there are organisms with more than 1,001 protein kinases. So when the human uh, genome was sequenced in 2001. My colleagues, Gerard Manning and, and I, uh, compiled the human kinome, and, and this is the tree of 478 protein kinases with seven major branches. Tyrosine kinase is on the top. This is the branch that contains the basophilic protein kinases like cyclic A dependent protein kinase the CMGC branch, which are proline-directed kinases, like the CDKs and the MAP kinases. And this is the CAM kinase branch, some of which are regulated by calcium. In addition to these related protein kinases, there are a number of atypical protein kinases, either not related or only distantly related to this larger family. But these include very important protein kinases like ATM, ATR, mTOR, and DNA-PK. So there are a total, we, at that time, we had a total of 518 human protein kinases. Interestingly, about 10% are missing key catalytic residues in those motifs and are classified as pseudokinases, and they, many of them have scaffolding functions. Now, if we fast forward, uh, another nearly 20 years, a number of new protein kinases have been added, but all of them are atypical protein kinases. They're very remotely related to the main family. So we're hovering at around 535. And over a third of these have been implicated in human disease through mutation or um, overexpression or underexpression in some cases. And a number of them have been shown to be involved um, in specific human diseases. So there are mutations in kinases that cause uh, 
immunodeficiency, et cetera, but by far the majority are involved in, in cancer, which is where we first started. And that led to a huge effort to develop uh, small molecule inhibitors of, of disease causing, causing protein kinases, particularly the tyrosine kinases. And as of uh, September last year, there are 77 kinase inhibitors that have been approved for clinical use by the FDA. And 52 of these are tyrosine kinases. And this is the timeline of their um, approval, starting with Gleevec, as you heard, back in nine, uh, 2001. And you can see there's just been a steady march of um, new drugs, including um, eight that were approved in, in 2020 here. And um, one of them, or maybe more than one of them, this is one of the, the JAK tyrosine kinase inhibitors are in clinical trials for um, COVID-19 patients. I don't know how successful they've been, but they, they are in trials. So with that background, which took a little longer than I had hoped, but let's go on. Um, I'm gonna talk about histidine phosphorylation, which has been a new interest in the lab for about um, seven or eight years now. So we've talked about the phosphorylation of the hydroxy amino acids, tyrosine, serine, and, and threonine, but six other amino acids can be phosphorylated. The uh, three basic amino acids, lysine, arginine, and histidine, the two acidic amino acids, aspartic acid and glutamic acid, and also cysteine. And they form different uh, phosphate adducts. So hydroxy amino acids form phosphate esters. Whereas as I'll show you, the basic amino acids form phosphoramidates, N-linked phosphate. So just, so just to remind you then, tyrosine phosphorylation, sorry, tyrosine phosphorylation of the phenolic hydroxyl group leads to the formation of a phosphate ester. It's very heat stable and it's even acid stable. In contrast, histidine phosphorylation, which I'll focus on, forms upon phosphorylation, uh, phosphoramidates, either an N1 phosphoramidate or an N3 phosphoramidate on the imidazole ring. And these, both of these linkages, these PN phosphorus nitrogen bonds are very heat labile, heat, they're sensitive to boiling, and they're very sensitive to any acidic pH below around five which makes them very challenging to, uh, to work with. So just to summarize uh, briefly um, what we know about histidine phosphorylation, some of you may know of its role in bacterial two-component signaling systems, which have a receptor-like protein that recognizes an external stimulus in the plasma membrane. These enzymes autophosphorylate on a histidine and that phosphate is transferred onto an aspartate res residue in a second protein, often a transcription factor that serves as the response regulator. <clears throat> now, this system, this type of system is, is uh, lacking in, in uh, most eukaryotic cells, particularly in mammals. But instead, there appear to be two enzymes, the NMEs, uh, that uh, act as histidine kinases. They also have a phosphohistidine intermediate that can then be transferred onto the histidine in a second protein. So these, these two proteins, enemy one and enemy two, are nucleoside diphosphate kinases. They're housekeeping enzymes that use ATP through a phosphoenzyme intermediate. Um, to phosphorylate nucleoside diphosphates like GDP. But they also moonlight as protein kinases and can use the phosphate, um, phosphoenzyme intermediate to phosphorylate proteins. 
Now, there are a number of enzymes that have phosphohistidine intermediates. Uh, enemies have the one phosphohistidine, so that's the nitrogen. The one nitrogen is phosphorylated. But most phosphoenzyme intermediates are three phosphohistidine, such as phosphoglycerate mutase that I'll mention briefly, and also ATP citrate lyase that I'll also mention briefly. And then in addition, there are at least three different phosphatases that can remove the phosphate. And so these, this is a potentially reversible PTM here. And we know of a number of proteins that seem to be regulated by histidine phosphorylation, particularly this potassium channel here, uh, the calcium activated potassium channel KCA3.1, which I'll show you. And interestingly, histone H4 is phosphorylated on histidine 18 in its N-terminal tail. This is conserved in all eukaryotes, but we really don't understand what its function is in, in chromatin regulation. So putting all this together then, um, we know that histidine phosphorylation can regulate uh, surface receptors and ion channels. It's also implicated in, in mitochondrial biology. There's a special uh, enemy family member that's in the mitochondria. Uh, we found evidence that it might be playing a role in, in the cell cycle at the centrosome and spindle poles. And we think it probably has a function in the nucleus as well. So I've told you how unstable this modification is. And the question is, how can we study it? globally. And we thought many years, over 20 years ago now, that one way we could study it would be if we could generate antibodies to phosphohistidine by analogy with the very powerful phosphotyrosine antibodies that have, had become so useful even by 1989. So I asked a graduate student to try and, to try and raise antibodies to phosphohistidine, but um, he failed and went on to work on the SARC protein kinase. And we think, we think the failure was the fact that the phosphohistidine in this bacterial protein was simply too unstable when it was injected into a rabbit in Freund's adjuvant. <coughs> so we knew what we needed was stable analogs of phosphohistidine, and we had to wait for two chemical groups to devise these phosphotriazolyl alanine analogs uh, as a one phosphotriazolyl alanine with a phosphorus carbon bond. This is the sort of imidazole ring-like uh, R group. And this is the three PTZA. And we built these analogs into a peptide backbone containing degenerate alanine and glycine residues and coupled this to KLH and, and immunize rabbits to generate sequence independent antiphosphohistidine antibodies. And we were pleased that we got <clears throat> antibodies that were selective either for one phosphohistidine or three phosphohistidine to test uh, their ability to recognize one phosphohistidine. We used um, the enzyme intermediate of NME1 and you can see a nice strong blotting signal here with the uh, antiserum. And then for the three phosphohistidine, we used phosphoglycerate mutase, the glycolytic enzyme, which has three PHIS, and you can see it was recognized by the three PHIS, whoops, sorry, the three PHIS um, antibodies. And I told you that the linkage is unstable to boiling. So these SDS gel samples, you cannot boil. You have to simply incubate them on ice with sample buffer because if you boil them, you can see most of the signal goes away. So we've used boiling actually as a control in all of our blotting experiments to show that we were detecting phosphohistidine. We used the spleen cells from these rabbits to go on and, and make monoclonal antibodies to, the, to one phosphohistidine and three phosphohistidine. And here is one of the one PHIS monoclonals used to um, Lot a series of extracts from pancreatic cancer cell lines. So in each case, there's a boiled lane and an unboiled lane. And you can see that the major 1P his proteins in cells are actually enemy one and enemy two themselves, although there are other proteins whose signal goes away with boiling. 
And then here are blots with two of the three PHIS monoclonals, uh, an E. coli lysate or a 293 cell lysate. And you can see lots of bands that in both cases that go away with, <clears throat> with boiling. Some of them we know what they are, but many uh, we don't specifically. So we have three unique 1P HIS and four unique 3P HIS monoclonals from all of these uh, efforts. And they can be used for immunoblotting, uh, immunofluorescence staining, immunohistochemistry, and in affinity enrichment of phosphohistidine containing proteins and triptych peptides for mass spec. And we have the structure of five of these antibodies bound to uh, phosphor TZA peptides. And I'm not going to go through this, but you can see that the phosphate on the ring in both cases is recognized by several interactions. And if you look at the orientation of the 1P HIS and the 3P HIS in the active uh, binding site, you can see why the 3P HIS antibody in this case, SC39, is selected for 3 versus 1 phosphohistidine. So we're now trying to use these structures to engineer these antibodies to make them even more selective. By immunofluorescence staining and of uh, proliferating HeLa cells, we found this very interesting 3P HIS staining of this dot in the cytoplasm that duplicated early, in early prophase and became the spindle poles. In uh, anaphase, so this, this is uh, staining of the cytoplasmic centrosomes. So this suggests that then histidine phosphorylation is playing some role in, in the cell cycle. And for that uh, KCA 3.1 channel that Ed Skolnick had shown is phosphorylated by uh, NME2 on histidine 358, and dephosphorylated by one of those three phosphatases, we could show in collaboration with them that um, this phosphorylation occurs on the three position and not the one position. So we can use these antibodies to define the isotype of phosphorylation. And in this case, um, further work from their group showed that phosphorylation of this histidine relieves um, inhibition uh, driven by the binding of a copper ion to the four histidines in the C-terminal tails of this tetrameric channel. So that upon phosphorylation by NME2, um, a copper can no longer chelate and now the channel can open. So we used um, the antibodies to enrich phosphohistidine-containing proteins from fully denatured lysates um, and carried out mass spec analysis and found a lot of proteins that appeared to contain phosphohistidine because we had a, a boiled control here. Uh, were involved in RNA biology, splicing, processing, translation. Some were involved in cell cycle processes based on GO terms. And gratifyingly, we found proteins we expected, histone H4, the NMEs, osteoglycerate mutase, and, and ACL1. <clears throat> now, that doesn't establish the sites that are histidine phosphorylated. And so um, we have uh, devised methods to try and map sites of histidine phosphorylation. You can't use conventional uh, phosphoproteomic methods because uh, acidic conditions are used for phosphopeptide enrichment. And so we've used immobilized, uh, our immobilized uh, antibodies uh, and hydroxyapatite chromatography to enrich for phosphohistidine containing proteins under neutral conditions and then carried out mass spec analysis. And this is the work of Kevin Adam, who has identified several new phosphohistidine sites in interesting proteins <clears throat> and many others. And we have phosphoglycerate mutase where we found histidine, phosphohistidine 11, we know that's the active site. Interestingly, our method also enriched some phosphoarginine and phospholysine sites. Here's a site in, in ATM, the, the DNA damage responsive uh, kinase. And in terms of motifs, well, there isn't really a strict motif, but we find a lot of leucines in the vicinity um, of the phosphorylated histidine, and we're not yet sure whether this is 
somehow an artifact of the way we've isolated the phosphohistidine peptides or whether it's real, it may simply stabilize the phosphohistidine from degradation. And other groups have worked on this as well, particularly Claire Ayers at the University of Liverpool has developed another way of enriching these non-canonical phosphopeptides um, and published her work a, a year or so ago now. So based on our work and that of others, we, we think maybe there's this hidden phosphoproteome of all these un, un, you know, unconventional phosphor amino acids could be as large as 20% of all phosphate linked to protein. And this obviously could be a, um, a really important work area in the future for any student who's interested. So I'm gonna skip just a little bit here and just ask, you know, there are lots of open questions, but how, how would histidine phosphorylation regulate protein activity if it's used reversibly? <clears throat> Is it used for short-term responses because it's, uh, it's an unstable uh, modification, even in the absence of, of enzym enzymatic dephosphorylation? Are there phosphohistidine specific binding domains like SH2 domains? Is it a charge effect? There's a large change from plus one on histidine to minus two on phosphohistidine. Or can it regulate metal ion binding as it does in the, in the potassium channel? So lots of open questions. So um, I'll tell you very briefly about you know, some of the functional work we've done on histidine phosphorylation. This was done in collaboration with Mike Hall's group at, the Beer Centrum in Basel, who had um, <coughs> developed a mouse model of hepatocellular carcinoma, liver cancer, by um, knocking out uh, TSC1, a regulator of mTORC1 signaling, and <coughs> uh, P10, which regulates mTORC2 signaling. And so these mice, where this double knockout is conditional to hepatocytes develop multi-nodal multi hepatocellular carcinoma by about four months. And so Michael's group then decided to see if they could identify alterations in protein kinases and phosphatases in these tumors at the protein level. And all the kinases they found by their proteomic analysis. The two histidine kinases were upregulated most significantly, and this LHPP phosphohistidine phosphatase was downregulated most significantly. And so that led to our collaboration where um, their group, particularly Sravanth Hindupur, uh, did um, immunoblotting with the 3P HIS and 1P HIS antibodies on tumor samples versus control liver samples with a boiled control. And there was a significant increase in 3P HIS in the tumor samples. And also in the level of phosphoenemy one and two uh, scored by the 1P HIS antibodies. So that piqued our interest in the LHPP phosphatase and so uh, my course group then used AAV expression by tail vein injection in the liver to show that um, overexpression of LHPP led to a dramatic decrease in the number and size of the, of the liver tumors in these mice. So that's consistent then with LHPP being some sort of tumor suppressor working by uh, regulating histidine phosphorylation. And uh, importantly, though, they were able to also show that human hepatocellular uh, carcinoma samples had elevated levels of 3P HIS and, and 1P HIS. And you can see here is the almost complete absence of LHPP that is downregulated in these tumors. So also we're interested in which, um, in which proteins are phosphorylated in, in HCC that might be driving the tumor. Uh, we think LHPP is serving as a tumor suppressor through its histidine phosphor dephosphorylation activity. 
And all of this suggests that maybe histidine phosphorylation could be targeted as a new type of therapy for hepatocellular carcinoma and possibly other cancers. Now we, we've looked at a few other cancers in pediatric neuroblastoma, uh, NME1, I think I'll go to the next slide. NME1 is on a, a chromosome 17Q arm that's often amplified and this leads to elevated levels of phosphohistidine in, in neuroblastomas. And interestingly, if you knock down NME1 in one of these neuroblastomas, then you see an increase in um, the, the rate of cell migration. So we still don't quite understand why that is, but oh, I'm sorry, I seem to have. There we go. Uh, an increase in the rate of migration into a scratch room. So that's, and that's an interesting observation. Oh, there we go. We've looked in, in breast cancer and uh, we can see uh, strong phosphohistidine signals here. Interestingly, in this case, particularly in the, uh, the most aggressive uh, triple negative breast cancers, LHPP levels seem to be increased um, compared to normal, you can see here, um, rather than decreased. And you can see here with um, uh, this immunohistochemical staining for LHPP, there is strong st uh, staining. Sorry, I said that the wrong way around. The, the triple negative breast cancers have lower levels than the luminal breast cancers. And you can see strong staining here in, in the luminal uh, cancers. And then finally, we've looked at uh, pancreatic cancer, um, which is an interest in the lab. And it's, it's, it was already known that uh, pancreatic cancers are addicted to acetyl CoA, and particularly you require acetyl CoA um, ATP citrate lyase, which generates acetyl CoA. And this is one of those enzymes that has a 3 phosphohistidine intermediate. And acetyl CoA is important in pancreatic cancer, both for de novo lipogenesis, but also for um, histone acetylation in the nucleus. And we can see high levels of uh, phospho ACLY in uh, pancreatic uh, tumor tissue from a KPC mouse model of pancreatic cancer. Uh, and that most, most of the um, three phosphohistidine signal in these uh, double immunofluorescence sections here. Uh, in, so in red, you can see that much of the three signal is in uh, regions of the tumor that are stromal rather than the regions of the tumor stained here in green, which are the tumor cells. And Natalie Lutala, who's done this work in the lab, has evidence that this is um, largely due to histidine phosphorylation in the hematopoietic cells in, in the pancreatic cancer, and particularly to the macrophages. And so we're currently trying to test how important this is in macrophages using a conditional um, ATP citrate lyase uh, knockout. So let me spend just 10 minutes, and I'll run a little bit over. On the, on the final project, which is, which is more translational, and that is our studies of, um, of pancreatic cancer, which is, you probably know, um, is, a, is a, a lethal disease. Um, it's the third leading cause of cancer death with a high mortality rate because it's, it's almost always diagnosed too late. And, and the tumors go through a series of, of genetic changes, particularly important is an activating mutation in KRAS, loss of PK, uh, P16R, uh, loss of function of P53 and SMAD4. And these changes are correlated with morphological changes that uh, lead to a series of um, panins. These are the pancreatic cancer sort of in situ, followed ultimately though by um, invasive, invasiveness uh, into surrounding tissue 
interization into the bloodstream, extravasation and formation of uh, metastasis commonly in the liver. So like all solid tumors, pancreatic cancer is not comprised just of tumor cells. It has um, multiple cell types. In addition to the tumor cells here, it has obviously blood vessels for endothelial cells and pericytes. Um, it has a, 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 a large um, population of inflammatory cells, mostly macrophages, and particularly important, uh, a large uh, population of cancer-associated fibroblasts. And, and these all, all make up a community of cells that have to talk to each other and support each other. And the pancreas and liver are unusual in having this type of stellate cell. It's a star-shaped cell that is present in the normal tissue, but in response to in inflammation or cancer, then um, these cells become activated. They, they transition into myofibroblasts, usually known as, as cancer-associated uh, fibroblasts or CAPs. And so the question we wanted to address was, how uh, do these different cell types communicate? And particularly, what are the paracrine factors that the activated stellate cells produce that act on the pancreatic cancer cells? So pancreatic tumors are sort of unusual and they tend to be organized as a nest of tumor cells um, surrounded by these cancer associated fibroblasts which build a very dense stromal matrix. And, and we already knew before we started that the tumor cells make soluble factors like TGF beta and PDGF that activate the stellate cells into cancer associated fibroblasts. And we wanted to know what did the fibroblasts make that <clears throat> acted back on the tumor cells to support tumor progression. And what we found was the, the lift cytokine. And so this was work of Yu Shi and Rujin Tian <clears throat> in the lab. And what they decided to do was to just analyze proteome, uh, proteomically the secreted proteins or the secretome of a human cancer cell, pancreatic cancer cell line and activated uh, stellate cells. And with biological replicates, they found thousands of proteins made by each cell. But we focused really on proteins made uniquely by the tumor cells or the stellate cells. And particularly, we focused on uh, growth factors, cytokines, and chemokines that might play a paracrine signaling role. When we looked at the stellate cells, we were fascinated by the production of LIF, whoops, sorry, um, leukemia inhibitory factor, which is a member of the IL-6 family, because LIF is a stem cell factor, and we wondered whether it played a role in, in tumor stem cells. So what we were able to show then was that the condition medium from activated stellate cells in culture stimulates uh, STAT3 phosphorylation, which is a typical cytokine response. Um, when we treated the stellate cells with condition medium, um, sorry, when we took the condition medium from the stellate cells and treated the tumor cells, we could observe the binding of the LIF receptor and its co-receptor to STAT3. And we could show that a neutralizing LIF monoclonal antibody blocks the ability of the conditioned medium to activate STAT in the tumor cells. Um, and as I said, LIF is a stem cell factor and it can also in elicit an invasive phenotype and induces an immunosuppressive microenvironment. And then one further thing is that if one looks at the TCGA gene expression data set, LIF is highly overexpressed in pancreatic cancer compared to any other tumor. And it's much more highly expressed, for instance, than the related IL-6. So this all led us to focus on LIF. And LIF, IL-6 and IL-11, the third family member, all have common signaling subunit GP130, but each have a unique cytokine binding subunit. Uh, 
the IL-6 uh, receptor, the IL-11 receptor, and the LIF receptor. And all of these signal through the JAK-STAT tyrosine kinase pathway, activating STAT to go into the nucleus to drive gene expression. They can also activate the ERK and PI3 kinase pathways. And just to show you um, some of the, the data then, um, if we take the KP4, uh, human pancreatic cancer cells and treat with conditioned medium from stellate cells, you see a strong um, phosphostat three signal, recombinant lift, you get a strong phosphostat three si signal. If you knock down the lift receptor, uh, conditioned medium, uh, signaling through STAT3 is strongly reduced. And here's the anti-LIF antibody, it's uh, called D25. It almost totally abolishes the conditioned medium response. So next we had to test then whether LIF played a role in, in, in vivo and we used the KPC mouse developed by Dave Tuberson in which a activated mutant form of KRAS is um, conditionally expressed in the epithelial cells in the pancreas and p53 is conditionally deleted in the same cells and these mice develop a rapid and aggressive pancreatic cancer with a half-life to death of around 50 days and if we uh, crossed in a conditional allele of the LIF receptor into these mice, we found that the uh, time to, to death was strongly uh, increased, particularly in the presence of, of the gemcitabine uh, chemotherapeutic that's used in pancreatic cancer. We use RNA scope to show that um, LIF is most highly expressed in, in stromal cells adjacent to the blue tumor cells here, stained with um, keratin 19. And that the LIF receptor is most highly expressed in the tumor cells themselves compared to the stromal cells stained with periostin here. So the model became then that the stellate cells made LIF and um, this acted on the tumor cells, which could also perhaps make some lift, and there's a little bit of lift signal in the tumor cells. And then the tumor cells made factors like PDGF and TGF beta that acted back on the stellate cells. Now that was all in the mouse. Um, we could also show similar results in, in human pancreatic cancer. So you can see that lift is expressed primarily in stromal cells, probably ICAF type stromal cells close to the blue tumor cells here. So will the LIF antibody work in the tumor? Well, yes, uh, if we use it at 25 mg per kilogram, three times a week, you can see a strong reduction in the phosphostat three staining in the tumors from a, a KPC uh, mouse compared to the brown stain, nuclear stain here. Um, so this, we then set up a, um, a therapeutic treatment protocol, which we co combined, or we used either the antibody alone or an IgG control alone, or we combined them with gemcitabine in this protocol here, starting at um, 30 days of age, uh, when there are already tumors uh, apparent. And um, if you compare control IgG with the green lift line, there is an extension of survival in the KPC model, but there's a particularly strong effect when the lift antibody is combined with gemcitabine, and you can see now almost a doubling of survival. And in a slightly different model where we pre-treated the mice with a triple chemotherapy, um, paclitaxel, gemcitabine and cisplatin, and then followed this with anti-LIF treatment, uh, maintenance gemcitabine, we saw an almost a doubling of, of time to survival. So this is, is quite impressive. 
so what we conclude then is that lift blockade with a neutralizing antibody can slow tumor progression in, the, in this mouse model and enhances the response to chemotherapy. And I couldn't resist showing you this very new piece of data because it was um, generated by my son, Sean, uh, for his thesis work in Jennifer Cochran's lab at Stanford, where he was a graduate student. And he developed from a fragment of the lift receptor ex ex ectodomain, an engineered lift trap, which has about a 30 fold higher affinity for lift than the um, parent lift receptor. And when used to treat mice um, carrying a KP4, a human cell derived xenograft tumor, you can see that this ELIF RFC has a pretty dramatic effect on, on tumor growth uh, uh, as a monotherapy. So that's quite encouraging and suggests this might become a new pancreatic cancer therapy. So lift blockade is um, targeting a, what appears to be a cancer stem cell population. The tumors are more uh, differentiated. Um, there's a decrease in um, EPCAM positive, that's tumor cell cells that are positive for CD133, which is a stem cell marker. And the EPCAM positive cells have a strongly reduced ability to grow spheroids in cultures after anti-lift treatment of the mouse or grow as, um, as tumors. So lift blockade is reducing the abundance of EPCAM positive tumor cells with stem cell like properties, which then increases tumor differentiation. So now we wanted to determine, this is the last, last two or three slides, whether um, we could use LIF uh, diagnostically and whether what we'd found in the mouse was, was true in, in people. So if we look at the level of, of LIF in, in, in uh, either the normal pancreas, pancreas uh, induced to undergo chronic pancreatitis or in the tumors, we can see, and this is a log scale, um, a large increase in the amount of LIF, in, in, uh, particularly in the tumor tissue, but also to some extent in, in the chronic pancreatitis tissue, which contains activated uh, CAFs, or stellate cells. And we also, uh, at five weeks of age, we can begin to detect LIF in the serum of these, of these mice. So what about people? Um, well, uh, we can detect uh, elevated levels in a significant fraction of LIF, uh, of, of, of elevated levels of LIF in a significant fraction of, of the human tumor samples here, but not all perhaps, by an ELISA assay and also uh, by using a targeted mass spec analysis. This is the work of Ruijin Tian now in his own lab in Shenzhen. And using uh, this high sensitivity Quantarix Samoa ELISA, digital ELISA assay, we can also detect high levels of LIF in the serum of, of human pancreatic cancer patients. Again, a log scale here. And if we compare um, the levels of lift with the differentiation status of the tumors in these different patients, you can see that the levels of lift are rising uh, as the differentiation status uh, decreases and the, the tumor becomes more aggressive. Now we've compared the level of lift in serum of patients to that of CA99, the current pancreatic cancer biomarker and we see high levels of both of them, but if we compare within the same tumor, there are many tumors which have uh, high LIF and low CA199 and vice versa. And then finally, um, we've done a little bit of work with our clinical colleagues at, at Honor Health in, uh, in Tucson to look at the effects of, um, of uh, therapy, uh, chemotherapy, on lift levels. So this is preoperative uh, neoadjuvant therapy with uh, NAB, Paclitax, LGM, cytobine, cisplatin, paracalcitol, and, a, and an immune checkpoint antibody. 
And in this two week uh, treatment window, um, patients who underwent an objective response showed a decrease in the level of, of lift. So that, that's quite encouraging and, and does suggest then that circulating lift could be used perhaps as a, as a biomarker and as a, a gauge of therapeutic response. So then I summarize uh, these experiments by um, concluding that lift then plays a driver role in a mouse model of pancreatic cancer. It clearly acts on tumor cells, but we think it can also act uh, on other stromal cells, particularly we have new evidence that it acts on tumor associated macrophages. The levels of lift in serum and tumor samples correlate positively with progression in human pancreatic cancer and it could potentially be used as a biomarker in pancreatic cancer diagnosis and um, therapy. So could it be targeted therapeutically? Well, Northern Biologics now um, taken over by um, AstraZeneca developed a humanized lift monoclonal antibody, MSC1, that has been in a phase one trial, which has included some pancreatic cancer patients um, they are still analyzing the data, but potentially um, this, this is uh, going to be taken forward into a phase two trial in, in combination with other types of, of therapeutic. So I think this is a very encouraging outcome of um, our work in pancreatic cancer. Um, and hopefully this can all be translated in, into a improved therapy for for this deadly cancer. So let me just thank the people who, who did the work. Um, the LIFT project was spearheaded by Yu Shi uh, in my lab, who took this project on right from the outset and did most of it single-handedly. He collaborated with um, Rijin Tian, who at the time was a postdoc in Tony Porson's lab. They had been to high school together and had known each other their whole lives, basically. So that was kind of a nice story. We uh, had help from many of our colleagues at, at the SOC, particularly Ron Evans and Jeff Wall, and our colleagues at uh, UCSD, particularly uh, Tanisha Shiria and uh, Nikki Lytle and Andy Lowy. And Tim Donahue at UCLA provided a lot of the tumor samples and we had funding from SU2C and Lust Garden, particularly. And then the histidine phosphorylation work was again spearheaded by a single postdoc, Steve Foos, who took this on when no one else in the lab wanted to do it. Uh, he had help from many people in the lab, particularly um, Aaron Aslanian for the mass spec and Kevin Adam and um, Rajasri Caligari for the structures and our colleagues uh, in Jack Marget's group at Sanofi who made the PTZA and then Michael Eskolnik uh, for the functional work and John Yates um, and his, his colleagues for um, Mass Spec and Ian Wilson and Robin Stanfield for the structure. So with that, I will finish. I can take questions. Oh, we're trying to make antibodies to phospholysine. And that will, I'll finish and take questions. This is uh, what you have to do to uh, raise money for pancreatic cancer research. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Tony, for an excellent talk. Wonderful. So questions? OK, can I start? Yeah, Ed, yeah. Go ahead. OK, so uh, I'm fascinated by the history in phosphorylation that you, uh, you showed. So, you know, my, some of my work involves uh, mitotic kinases. So I'm wondering, you know, the, uh, you know, cell cycle uh, proteins that you identified that have histidine phosphorylation, about 97 of them. And then you also showed uh, centrosome localization uh, of uh, histidine phosphorylation with some of the monoclonal antibodies. So I was wondering whether some of those cell cycle proteins are actually centrosome, known centrosome proteins. Uh, and, you know, you can pinpoint which I, proteins 
Yeah, there are some proteins that are known to, that come out of phosphoproteomic analysis of centrosomes are in our list. Um, okay. I can't remember what they are off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, as you know, the centrosomes are a pretty complicated structure. So it's, I don't think it's any of the well-known ones. We okay. sort of, uh, well, it's A, it's a matter of number of hands. I don't have people to go after all of these things. Um, I think we feel that the next step will be to really to, to validate the histidine phosphorylation of one of those proteins by studying it in more depth. And so each protein, um, you know, you want to validate is really a one, you know, it takes, takes a lot of work by one person. So we are looking at a few proteins like um, topoisomerase uh, and LCK, but, um, you know, we, we still are on the process of trying to, to, to be certain that we have a, a valid site and then we need to mutate the site and also to generate phosphohistidine specific, sequence specific antibodies, which we can do. We've done that for, uh, for enemy one, but I think that will be the next step at looking at any individual protein to see if you can really detect the phosphorylation in cells and whether it changes say, say uh, <clears throat> during the cell cycle. Yeah, so that's what I was going to ask actually. You know, we know that, uh, for example, with the tyrosine phosphorylation, if we starve the cell, everything goes down and then, you know, you can stimulate with the growth factors and then boom, you have a lot of tyrosine phosphorylation. So you know anything about regulation of uh, histidine phosphorylation, you know, you uh, in your blots, you know, you treat with the 95 degrees as a control Right. Uh, to get rid of that, but what about you know regulation? Is it growth factor related or uh, you know uh, oncogenes activated or right. what sort of regulation we know? All great ideas. Yeah, it was that was on the slide. I sort of skipped over. As uh, what do we know about histidine okay. phosphorylation? <laughs> um, we haven't seen any obvious changes when you serum starve or serum stimulate. So I, <clears throat> I don't think it's or stimulate with EGF. So it's not going to be that, that sort of response, I don't think. We think it might change in response to stress, and that's something we're still looking at. Um, but we don't have any obvious way, you know, we have not yet found an external uh, stimulus that changes histidine phosphorylation significantly. Uh, okay. So. We tried, but we failed to get a really clean um, cell cycle progression phosphohistidine uh, series. And so that's something we need to go back and do. We need to synchronize cells better and do the phosphohistine analysis, proteomic analysis, to see if we do see what looks like changes during the cell cycle. <clears throat> Okay, and you know, one of the things you talked about initially was, you know, there are, we, we know when proteins are phosphorylated, there are domains that recognize them. So how would you go about, uh, you know, looking for the domains that, for example, can recognize uh, histidine uh, phosphorylation? So we have tried, we basically immobilized our two different phospho TZA degenerate peptides onto columns uh, together with a non-phosphorylated uh, control and then poured extracts over them and eluted proteins from the, the bound. And we got a lot of proteins and nothing very obvious came out. And that's something that we obviously need to do again. Um, so that's one approach. Um, and then the second approach we're at seeing, we're testing whether different SH2 domains might actually recognize phosphohistidine. There are okay. some quite uh, degenerate SH2 domains that we think might bind phosphohistidine. So that's a th the second approach. And then the third approach is we're actually, together with a, a group in Toronto, Deb Sidhu, trying to evolve an SH2 domain into a phosphohistidine binding domain. Okay, the SH2 domain has usually two binding sites, right? It has, a, it, it binds the phosphotyrosine, 
Yeah. And then it binds one of the residues on the C terminal side. Yeah. 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 So we we would build that into what we're trying to do. Yes. Okay. So last question is about the lift. Uh, you know. Yeah. Um, you, you've shown that it activates, uh, uh, you know, the cytokine receptors and then, you know, stat phosphorylation. Uh, and you've, uh, in pancreatic cancer, you have uh, the RAS uh, oncogene activated. Uh, so, you know, how does blocking the, uh, you know, the JAG stat pathway actually affect uh, the RAS map kinase pathway? So have you looked at, you know, whether there's effect of LIF antibodies on the a uh, map kind of signaling, or you know, how, how does that work? I, I don't understand, uh, you know, blocking LIF, how does it affect the RAS driven tumors? Right. So the crosstalk between the pathways. Uh, I mean, LIF itself is reported to activate map, uh, map kinase, although in the pancreatic cancer cell lines, we've never really seen a very strong response. But certainly there is crosstalk. Um, you don't see very strong effects on phosphor work in, with the antibody. Um, but as I said, we don't see it. So the experiment we would do is we'd add LIF um, and then look to see, because the, the cells themselves make very little LIF, so there's not much autocrine signaling. So if you neutralize LIF, you're not going to see anything much in response. So we've tried adding LIF and then add the antibodies. And you don't see a really strong reduction in the phosphor work driven by KRAS. So whatever's happening uh, in the tumor where we clearly see this loss of EMT and loss of a stem cell like state is more complicated, I think. Um, so I think it's a good question. And we obviously would need to do more to see if we can figure out you know, why blocking LIF is having an effect on the tumor cells in in the in the in the tissue. Okay, thank you. Tony, uh, I have a question. So, uh, you although you said you could not find a, a motif for histidine phosphorylation, a specific sequence. Um, when I look at the uh, histone H four sequence, because you you said histone H4 has histidine phosphorylation at uh, histamine 18, yes. Uh, 18 and 75, I believe. Right. Uh, when I just looked at, while Fessel was asking you a question, I tried to see the sequence. Right. The, the histidine at 18 is right in the middle of two lysines and arginines on both sides. Right. And 75 is, so did someone, is, uh, is someone looking at chromatin uh, associated histidine phosphorylation, whether it is, um, it has something to do with gene regulation or? Um... Yeah, I mean, if you look, so the answer is, I, I, I expect there is. I have tried to persuade someone in my lab to do it and no one has taken it on, although I think I may have found someone now. Um, it's been hard to detect the histidine phosphorylation in histone preps, I must admit. So it's not clear how abundant it is. If you look at, where it is, um, there is one of these um, tonsil chaperones bind exactly to that site. And if you look at the, if you look at the structure of the bound histone tail, it's clear that phosphorylation of that histidine would kick the, the chaperone off, right? So I, I think it's gonna be something like that. What uh, we are hoping to do is to build a, an unnatural amino acid analog that um, is a non-cleavable phosphohistidine analog uh, that we could incorporate using the 21st codon strategy, I mean, 21st amino acid <clears throat> genetic code expansion strategy to put a phosphohistidine at the site in histone H4 or any other protein. So um, <clears throat> if we could do that, then I think we could have a lot of answers as to what these, what phosphohistidine does. Of course, it might be very toxic, I don't know. <clears throat> but um, uh, Tom Muir, who was one of the groups who made the TZA analogs has done some things with 
uh, he's made by uh, protein conjugation. He's made nucleosomes with phospho TZA18, and it uh, it what he tells me it's not never been published is that it causes chromatin opening. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's another approach is to do it in vitro with um, you know artificial chromatin. <clears throat> Yeah, it's fascinating. It's clearly uh, cons that histidine is conserved, that the whole sequence is conserved, and as is the phosphorylation. But we did, I, I did persuade someone to mutate that histidine in yeast, and it doesn't have a very strong phenotype. So that's another problem. Okay. But it's gotta be, it's gotta be conserved for some reason. There's no question about it. So. Because I, I was just coming from fly side, I was thinking of, you know, if somebody uses your uh, monoclonal antibody and s try already in chromosome strainings, because these are specialized chromosomes um, stacked, you know, a number right. of, and maybe if the signal is low, uh, maybe in polydines uh, as a Might specialized tissue, you may detect something. Yeah, we've collaborated with an ex postdoc of mine, Ruth Palmer, who's in Sweden. Uh, to try and do this when it hasn't gone very far. She is also, uh, there are three enemy one homologs in Drosophila. So she's been playing around with some genetics, but it, yeah. it hasn't been a main focus of her lab. So it hasn't really gone anywhere, but it's a good idea. I agree. Yeah. 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 Other questions? Um, yeah, I have one. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, so I was reviewing uh, one of your papers. You mentioned in your talk that you're working on your blastoma as well. Um, right. So in some of your recent papers, you're using different cell lines and also tumors, um, tumor samples on your blastoma. Yes. Right? So I yeah. wanted to ask you that um, the reason why taking these two separately, is it because of the environmental factors that uh, you think might cater to the um, changes in signaling? Well, ultimately what we want to do, and we've had a really hard time getting uh, tumor tissue samples is, is to look in human tumors, right? And so we're using the cell lines to do some mechanistic studies. We generated some xenograft tumors so that we would have tumor tissue to play it to practice on for when we get human tumor tissue, which is very scarce. And these are mostly pediatric neuroblastomas and there isn't a lot of, you know, it's not very common and so there isn't a lot of tissue available. And so that's been our okay. strategy. Uh, that's how we're trying to do it. Okay, um, just one last question. So in that paper, you're using MICN, right? So why not MICC? Ah, that's a good question. So, it I, and I don't know why not mix C, but it turns out that if you look in neuroblastomas, it's only ever NMIC that is amplified and overexpressed. Mm -hmm. um, there's some subtle difference between the function of NMIC and CMIC that m means that NMIC is selected for amplification. Okay. Um, NMIC actually probably drives expression of NMEs. So there's some there's some interplay between NMIC as the transcription factor and the and the enemy kinases. Okay, um, because I thought there was more of a um, tissue area related differences between the two. Are you talking about? I'm not talking about comparison between neuroblastoma and other cancers, or why no, the primary and secondary one? So in neuroblastoma, there's a primary site, and then there's the secondary site. I, I was under the impression that MCN is expressed in other areas of the body as compared to MCC. MCN is, yeah, it's not so widely expressed as, as MCC and it's, it's certainly expressed in, in, in neural tissue, which of okay. course is the origin of these tumors, right? So maybe it makes sense from that point of view, right? Okay, thank you. Sure. So Tony, we have a question uh, from Ian, Ian Zelinger, uh, watching us on Facebook. So uh, he's asking, do we understand why uh, cancer starts at the stromal cells and not elsewhere? So why cancer does what in stromal cells? Uh, why cancer starts 
at stromal cells and not elsewhere? Well, um, I think you know, most, most tumors start in a niche of some sort, right? They're already in a tissue and they have to interact with the cells that are around them. And I think um, we, we know that inflammation can be a strong driver of cancer, for instance. So um, if um, macrophages get involved and induce an inflammatory environment, that is uh, pro-tumorigenic. And so then that can, the factors secreted by the macrophages can act on the tumor cells to promote their proliferation. I mean, if you, if you inject tumor cells into the flank of a mouse, you get tumors. Um, they're mostly tumor cells, but they, they, they always recruit additional cells into those tumors. So the fact, I mean, the fact probably is that tumor cells by themselves are not totally competent to form a tumor and they need a support group to, to help them survive um, in the body. That's, that's my interpretation. Okay. Any other questions, Abdullah? Or anyone else? So if there are no more questions, uh, so let's today. thank. Can yeah. I ask one last question? So, yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, Professor Hunter, you talked about uh, phosphorylation at, uh, you know, aspartic, aspartic acid, glutamic acid, and cysteine. I know that the aspartic acids are phosphorylated in P-type pumps, but where else the other phosphorylations uh, take, take place in the cell, for example? Well, I think we, you know, so... The whole field of aspartate phosphorylation or glutamate or cysteine in mammalian cells is really in its infancy. So Claire I has reported several sites of phosphorylation. Uh, in terms of where those happen in the cell, I think we don't know. What the kinase is, we don't know. Um, you know, aspartate phosphorylation is obviously quite well studied in bacteria because um, it's part of the two component systems. And there are even structures of proteins containing phosphor, uh, <clears throat> phosphoaspartate. So, um, but in mammalian systems, it's totally open. I don't, I don't know what's going to, you know. Do, do you think they are as, do you think they are as unstable as the histidine phosphorylation? And you know, you will need to make antibodies using the peptides as you described for histidine phosphorylation. Yes, I think they are. They are just as unstable to okay. heating particularly, maybe acid as well. Uh, um, that's true for the cysteine and the, I don't know about phosphoglutamate, phospho phosphoaspartate for certain, phosphoarginine and phospholysine are very unstable as well. There are antibodies to phosphoarginine. You can okay. buy them. Um, and there are quite a lot to know about phosphoarginine in, in bacteria. Um, and it actually free, free phosphoarginine is used in plants instead of phosphocreatine. So it's a, it's a high energy phosphate a reservoir. Um, that's why we're trying to make monoclonals to phospholysine to see if nothing is known about it, basically. Okay. You can make it, it clearly exists, but we don't know any protein that contains a, a phospholysine residue. I mean, we started on phosphohistidine because we knew there were proteins that really contained it, so we, we would have a good control for our antibodies. Okay, thank you. Okay, so if uh, there are no more questions, uh, let's all thank Professor Hunter. Uh, it was a real payer for all of us, uh, and I think it was a wonderful start of our day today. Uh, <laughs> we right. all really, really enjoyed it. And we wish you a good night there. It's it's a, a evening time, I believe there. It is. It's uh, about nine thirty. And I, before we close, though, I'd like to thank Abdullah for having approached me to give this seminar. I thought it was very good of him. I'm sorry we didn't really get a chance to talk to each other, but that was good initiative for him to uh, yeah. to ask me. Thank you very much for accepting it. And I know it's pretty late for you in the day, and probably tomorrow is the inauguration day, big day for. US. Big day for the US, you're right, finally. Yeah. yeah.
so thank anyway. you very much for taking a uh, time for our students and i am sure it will be very encouraging for their developing science uh, to hear from you today great and good luck with all, to all of you in your careers thank you very thank much you. we plenty to do yeah we look forward to see you one day uh, inshallah here in pakistan ah, that will be great <laughs> yeah okay thank you, thank you. bye 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 bye, -bye. Thank you.